are supportive. Let's pray together. Oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear, our hearts that we might feel. And then, oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. <clears throat> There's a lady here in our church, a wonderful lady, very um, classy. If you just you, you see her, you'd say, that's a classy lady. And uh, very dignified, uh, very, always knows the right thing to say. And so I saw her one uh, Friday afternoon, and I said, well, so what are your plans for the weekend? And she said, it was, I was just making small talk. She said, we're going to WrestleMania. <laughs> Down at the Toyota Center, professional wrestling, WrestleMania. Um, and I was like, you're what? She said, I'm going to WrestleMania. And I said, well, you're gonna paint your face and get a hat, you know, what are you gonna do? And she said, oh no, we're just going to be supportive. So I, I, I thought, how interesting, uh, wrestling. You know, uh, Paul is using athletic imageries in this uh, uh, passage. Gonna fight the good fight. Gonna, gonna finish the race. It's specific imagery. He's dealing with the ancient Greek Olympics, which uh, were uh, held from 776 BC to 393 AD, 1100 years. The uh, ancient Olympics were held in Athens. And uh, uh, they were, one of the funny things is that they were discontinued in 394 AD by the Emperor Theodosius I. And he, um, he said they weren't Christian, even though Paul's quoting him, of course. They weren't Christian because originally, when they were Greek, they were dedicated to the god Zeus. And he thought it was a pagan practice after Constantine had brought the Christian faith into the Roman Empire. So um, Paul is speaking about those, and two of the uh, greatest um, events in the ancient Olympics were boxing and wrestling. And so he said, I have fought the good fight. Do you ever feel like everything's a battle? It feels like around us now, sometimes everything seems to be a, a, a wrestling match, a battle of some sort. You know, I think it's the peas that have got us, the pandemic and, the, and, and polarization and personnel challenges, labor shortages, and uh, purchasing our, our supply chain challenges. And in the midst of all of that, you know what, as a pastor, I hear more about personal problems. They still go on. People have challenges in their families, challenges with their health, challenges at at work that they wrestle with. I'll have to say that personally, my, the battles that I find myself fighting are usually right in here. They're right inside my heart. They're, they're battles against cynicism, or they're battles against fear, or um, against this judgmental, condescending spirit that I, where you find yourself looking down your nose at people who disagree with you. All of these, these battles against anger and rage, ah, so much, so much that we are, are wrestling with. Paul is real clear in Ephesians that we are not battling against other people. See, we could demonize, that's our tendency, right? We're going to demonize, it's you, and it's you, and it's you, and it's you. You're the problem. Paul says, no, we're battling against spiritual forces of darkness. Our, our, this, this battle, these battles that we fight are to be pushing back the darkness that wants to just seep in into the world around us. And we want to be, we're, we're children of light, and so we want to, be, want to be pushing for the light, fighting for the light instead of the darkness. That's the business we're in. Paul writes this uh, letter of 2 Timothy from the Maritime Prison. Maritime Prison is in, in Rome. It is um, 
a terrible place. So all the prisons at that time, when we hear that Paul is writing in prison, we like to think of like a, you know, a jail with doors that clang shut. No, the, the prisons were cellars in, that were down in the ground. Um, and the way that they would put you in jail, in, a, in prison, was lower you through the hole. There were no doors to the room, so they would just lower you through the hole. And, and then if you got released, they'd put a ladder down for you to climb out, but other than that, there was no way out. They'd throw things down for you to eat. If you had someone to support you, to pay the money, or to bring you food to put down in the hole. The, the, um, the Roman historian Sallust says that the Maritime prison was full of neglect, darkness, and stench, and it gave it a hideous and terrifying appearance. And yet Paul writes from there still full of encouragement and exhortation. You can hear when you read the letter that there's this struggle inside, that the despair is kind of creeping in as he reaches the, his last days. But he still is encouraging and exhorting Timothy. You can do this. Lead well. Keep the faith. Don't stop. You can do this. Wow, it's a powerful picture. The New Testament reminds us over and over and over again that being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus is not, God's agenda is not to make our lives more comfortable, to make our lives easier, but in fact tells us that when we decide to be followers of Jesus, it's going to get harder. We're going to talk more about that next week. So how do we fight the good fight? What does it take? Well, it takes perseverance. So Paul says, I have finished the race. We too are to finish the race. Perseverance. <clears throat> you know how the, um, the marathon race was, uh, the, the legend is, was begun? So um, somewhere around 500 uh, the BC, the uh, Greeks defeated the Persians at a place called Marathon, the Battle of Marathon. And the general there sent the, uh, a Greek man named Pheidippides to run to Athens and tell them that the Greeks had defeated the Persians, turning, a turning place in the war. And so what does he do? He runs all the way to Athens and he says, rejoice, we conquer and then he falls down and dies. That's the legend. He ran all the way as fast as he possibly could, and when he got there, he made his announcement, and he died. Now, I don't know why hundreds of thousands of people a year sign up to run a race in which you die at the end, <laughs> but they do. There's, you have to get in a lottery nowadays to get into the race, to run uh, 26.2 miles uh, all, along the way. It is, uh, why do we do that? I can tell you why. I talked to some people right after the service who said, we've just finished our, our, our 945 service. We just finished our first marathon. We're so excited. Because you learn so much. I, I, I've run one marathon many years ago, and I will tell you, I didn't die, but I thought I was going to die. Uh, but it, 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 what you learn is that you can do this. If you will train and persevere, you can do this. It's not like it's easy. It's the fact that it takes this discipline over time, over training, to persevere and push forward is, is why we choose to do it. Because we learn in the midst of it the power of being of persevering in the face of challenges. Frank Shorter, the great um, runner, was having a really bad day in 1971. He got to, to mile 21, the, what they call the wall, and he said uh, he was getting passed by everybody and he just couldn't do it anymore and he had to quit. And he said, <laughs> the famous quote, he said, why couldn't Philippides have died here at mile 21? This would have been a good spot for that to have happened. It's, it, it takes this kind of perseverance and challenge. It, you see, there's a difference between passion and conviction. Passion is, is hot and, and it, it, it's volatile and, and conviction is this sort of slow burn. 
Passion is what makes you fall in love. Conviction is what lets you stay married for decades and do life together. A passion is that feeling you have when you first come to Jesus and you think, oh my goodness, I understand how much I'm loved. And you, you just feel that all over your body and you feel like you're walking on air. And conviction is what allows you to put one step in front of the other, in front of the other, in front of the other, no matter what the circumstances, no matter whether you feel it, to just keep on running. We are in the capital campaign. We are at this, uh, this position of 19 million now, and we've, we're at the wall, right? At mile 21, and so, but we're gonna per, we persist. I love this line, by the way. Um, I've put it up on, on a, printed it up on a, a, a piece of paper and put it on my wall in my study upstairs. It, Paul writes it in verse two. He says, be persistent whether times are favorable or unfavorable. Wow, what if I could live that? What if I could live being persistent whether times are favorable or unfavorable? There's this uh, um, tradition that has arisen now in college football where when they get to the fourth quarter, all of the students on, one, on, on the team, the home team, you know, and, and all of the players that are on the bench will hold up four fingers. Have you seen that? They get four fingers like this, meaning it's fourth quarter. We're not going to quit now. Let's go. Let's not give up. Got to finish strong. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I've been talking to some of the other staff about whether it's appropriate to mention the University of Texas and the last two Saturdays blowing the lead in the fourth quarter, and we decided it was too soon. I wasn't going to mention it. <laughs> well, you know, um, finishing strong, finishing the race. So what does it mean? What does he mean by that, to finish the race? Well, he describes it. He says, I, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Keeping the faith. So the word faith here is uh, an interesting one. It, in Greek, it is the word pistis. P-I-S-T-I-S, if you're transliterating it. And uh, pistis is, is a challenging word for English translators because it means both faith and faithfulness. So for example, it, pistis is a word that's used to describe the character of God. God is a faithful God. God won't let us down. God will keep God's promises. So it, it, it isn't about believing only. We talk about faith like it means to simply believe in Jesus. No, to have faith means to be faithful. To have faith means to live that belief with your feet and your hands and your voice. To be faithful, to have pistis, means to, to keep the faith, to not quit, to continue to try and live that faithful life no matter what. Here at St. Luke's, we talk about five inside-out habits that we encourage people uh, uh, to follow as a discipline. We pray and worship, right? We pray when it feels good and we pray when it feels not so good. We, we study the Bible. We don't just read the Bible, we study it. We uh, make friends, we build relationships, we tell our stories, we witness to our faith to other people. And finally, we give ourselves away in, in service and generosity. Paul says, I have been poured out like a drink offering. We give ourselves away. And here's the thing, sometimes that make that feels so fruitful and it feels like you're just being transformed and you're walking on air and sometimes it's like, come on, I'm just plodding along here, God. But we're going to keep the faith. We're going to stay at it. Now listen again what Paul says. He said, um, I have kept the faith, and henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, and not only for me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. <clears throat> He's talking about the, 
the, the, the victory crown. If you've ever run a marathon, there's always this little snide thing that somebody says to you. They say, well, did you win? And unless you're from Kenya, you didn't win, <laughs> right? You, 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 nobody goes, runs a marathon to win the marathon. I mean, you know, most of us anyway don't go to win the marathon. We're not going to win. We are going to finish. That's what matters. As, as followers of Jesus, we don't win. God provides a victory on that day, on the day of resurrection. God provides us the victory, but we don't make that happen. What we do is our, we continue to be faithful. Do we believe that because of our hard work in the Gethsemane Parish that every single child there will have a quality education? Ah, oh, that, that would be a dream, but do I believe that? If I believed that, I would ultimately be so cynical. Do I believe that because of the hard work we, we, uh, we do that no uh, uh, student, no teenager will find themselves falling into gang to gangs? No, I don't believe that. I would, I would have given up a long time ago. Do I believe because of, of, of our uh, great evangelism that every single person in that community or around this church or every student who comes to our Westheimer student ministry, every child who, who is in this neighborhood is going to know the amazing love of Jesus that Christ died for them and receive that? Do I believe that? Not because of our great work. No, the victory is God's. Our job is to be faithful. And we do believe that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. We do believe that the darkness will be pushed back and God will recreate the world and put it right again. And that's why Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, so just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And he says, because your labor is not in vain. God will ultimately make things right. That's what we believe. So what is our job? We are just to be faithful and let God worry about that victory. Let me close with this. <clears throat> In uh, 1964, a runner uh, from Sri Lanka, whose name I cannot pronounce, was um, running the 10K run, 25 laps around the track, and he um, is, while he's running, he is the slowest of all the runners. And in fact, the winner laps him many times. And once the winner wins, the winner wants to take that victory lap, you know, where they hold the, hold the flag and they run around and they're cheering for the victor. And all the crowd is ready for the victor to run his victory lap. And so they see this guy continuing to run on the track. And the, and the victor can't go out and run. And so the crowd begins to boo him as he's trudging around the track over and over. Until finally they realize what's happening. And so they stop. And then they begin to cheer. And they cheer him on. Because he, he had come 4,000 miles, sent by his country 4,000 miles, not to start a race, but to finish it. That's what we're called to do. I don't know where you are on your spiritual journey. I don't know what the headwinds you're facing are, or the battles you're fighting. Sometimes you may be just on fire for Jesus or just putting one foot in front of the other. But fight the good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. Pray with me. Gracious God, all this world around us, uh, just so many uh, challenges, so many headwinds, and yet in the midst of it, you have placed us here and called us to faithfulness. And so we will be faithful, God. By the power of your Holy Spirit, send that within us that we can keep running and don't, don't stop until that time when we finish the race, knowing for sure that on that day, you will give us the victory. In the name of Christ, we pray.